Today, we call this country Iran. For most of its history, however, it was known as Persia, an enormous empire in the ancient world, a part of the early Muslim caliphate in the Middle Ages, a standalone empire again in the 1600s, Iran's location has ensured that the area participates in almost all major events in global history. Well, this includes the era of decolonization and the Cold War. Today's lesson is on the Iran-Contra affair. Since the early Middle Ages, Iran's history has been different from that of the other Muslim states, because in Iran, most Muslims are Shia as opposed to Sunni. The Shia believed that only direct relatives of Muhammad should rule the Muslim state, and so when non-relatives were chosen as leaders, they broke away and established a separate Muslim denomination. In the 16th century, the Shia established the first Shia state, the Safavid Empire, which fought regularly with its Sunni neighbors and, while the Safavid Empire had disappeared by the late 18th century, their legacy, a mostly Shia population, had not. Subsequent Persian states were all associated with the Shia tradition. In the 19th century, as European countries were solidifying their colonies in Asia, Persia was able to stand autonomously in part because European countries, particularly Britain, found it easier to negotiate and, because at that moment, Persia had no real resources to offer. Then, in the early 20th century, a British expedition discovered oil in Persia, and suddenly it was an area in high demand. Since Persia wasn't a colony, the British had to negotiate for oil rights, which they did by forming the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which would eventually become BP, or British Petroleum. After World War I, Persia would officially become Iran, a country that had a constitutional monarchy and was thus led by kings, called shahs, as well as a parliament and prime minister. Well, during World War II, Iran served as a corridor for the Allies to get supplies to the Soviet Union. In the aftermath of war, tensions rose when the Soviet Union was slow to withdraw its troops from Iran. So Iran was involved in the Cold War from the very beginning. In 1951, Iran elected a new prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh. He proved very popular as he nationalized the oil industry, pushing the British out of oil production in Iran. This, of course, sounded very much like communism to the West. And so, in 1953, a joint and secret CIA-British agreement engineered a coup in Iran, which overthrew Mossadegh and replaced him with the Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, a king who was sympathetic to Western values and ideals. The Iranian people were unhappy with this change, particularly since the Shah tried to create a more secular, capitalist state in a country which was still mostly traditional. When criticism arose, the Shah sent his secret police, the Savak, to arrest and torture political enemies. This move was, again, unpopular, and a movement arose to overthrow the Shah. Now, the movement against the Shah actually had two branches. One branch was made up of Iran's intellectual elite, lawyers, professors, doctors, people who liked the secular values but disliked the Shah's authoritarianism. Well, the other branch was made up of more the religious elite, the conservative members led by the Ayatollah Khomeini. For a brief time, in 1979, these two branches came together to overthrow the Shah. But then the Ayatollah Khomeini took charge of this Iranian revolution, and the religious conservatives moved to take over Iran's government. The Shah, who was suffering from illness, had gone to the United States for treatment, and he simply never returned home. The Ayatollah took to calling the United States the Great Satan, and anti-Western sentiment grew in Iran. In April of 1979, Iran formally became an Islamic Republic, and a new constitution was written to reflect that the country had a theocratic government, a government which was run by God and or his representatives. In this case, while the constitution called for the creation of a parliament, a prime minister, and a president, the Ayatollah was considered the real political power in Iran. In November of 1979, a group of students demonstrating in front of the American embassy overwhelmed the embassy's walls and took control of the complex. They were demonstrating because they were angry that the United States had refused to extradite the Shah to stand trial in Iran. And while a few embassy workers escaped, that's what the movie Argo is based on, 52 of them were held hostage by these demonstrators. 
Although the Carter administration attempted to negotiate their release, it wasn't until Reagan's inauguration in January of 1981 that most of these hostages were released. In all, they'd been held for 444 days. All was not rosy for Iran, however. In 1980, Iraq had begun a war along the Iran-Iraq border. Iraq had hoped to take advantage of the chaos in Iran to take over valuable oil fields. In addition, Iraq's president, Saddam Hussein, also believed Iran planned to expand the Islamic Revolution. And as this revolution was Shia in nature, he wanted to block its expansion from Iraq. When this latter move, blocking the Islamic Revolution, Iraq was supported by both Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, especially after the Ayatollah proclaimed that monarchies were un-Islamic forms of government. And of course, both Kuwait and Saudi Arabia are monarchies. Unfortunately for Iraq, Iran was able to fight back quite admirably, and despite its recent political upheaval. By 1982, Iraq's president, again Saddam Hussein, had sought and was receiving help from other Gulf Coast states and from the West, including the United States. He was also receiving help from the East. The Soviet Union was angered that the new Iranian government had outlawed communism in Iran. So the Iran-Iraq war marks one of the few times that the United States and the USSR were on the same side during the Cold War. Of course, Iran was already on the U.S.'s bad side, both because of the earlier nationalization of oil production, remember that's communism, and because of the hostage situation between 1979 and 1981. And yet, Iran's involvement in the Cold War was more than just a side note to the Iran-Iraq war. However, to really understand it, you've got to begin on the other side of the world, in Central America. Now, in 1978, President Jimmy Carter had withdrawn military and economic aid to Nicaragua on the fear of human rights abuses. In 1979, if you'll remember, the Sandinistas took power, and Carter's administration recognized this new government. In fact, Carter's administration withdrew support for militaristic dictators across Latin America, again because of human rights issues, regardless of whether they were anti-communist or not. In 1980, however, the relationship between the Sandinistas in Nicaragua and the American government frayed, simply because, in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected U.S. president. When Reagan became president in January of 1981, he was a committed anti-communist, and he was unwilling to support or recognize communist regimes in Latin America. And this, of course, includes Nicaragua. O'Regan believed that the Sandinistas were aiding communist rebels in other parts of Latin America, particularly in El Salvador, and he instituted an economic boycott of Nicaragua. After 1983, Reagan's administration gave increasing support, both monetary and military, to the Contras, a CIA-backed anti-communist group that was trying to overthrow the Sandinistas. The American Congress was less sure of this boycott, and... In 1984, they also withdrew monetary support from the Contras. They imposed a two-year ban on all military aid to them. Now, here's where it gets fun. Despite this ban, some within the Reagan administration continued to support the Contras. The methods they used to continue the support became a well-known scandal, which was known as the Iran-Contra Affair. In 1984, the Reagan administration was facing a world in which communism was spreading in the Western Hemisphere. Westerners, including Americans, were being kidnapped in the Middle East, and an ally, Iraq, was involved in a tense war with the country that called the United States the Great Satan. Now, how can the United States better its situation? Well, the plan was simple. Senior officials in the Reagan administration planned to use a U.S. ally in the Middle East, Israel, to aid Iranian moderates who wanted to overthrow the Ayatollah and to gain the release of seven U.S. hostages who were being held in Lebanon. These hostages were held by Hezbollah, a group with ties to the Iranian army. And at the height of the Iran-Iraq war, the United States knew that what the Iranians probably wanted were weapons. So, this was the plan. Israel would sell arms, quote-unquote, to moderate Iranians with army connections, Uh, These Iranians supposedly, again, wanted to overthrow the Ayatollah, and so politically this kind of makes sense. In exchange, these moderate Iranians would pay Israel for these weapons and speak to Hezbollah in Lebanon to try to secure the release of the American hostages. 
who in return, the United States would replace the weapons that Israel had sold to Iran, and then they would be paid with the money the Iranians had originally given to Israel, and hopefully with the release of these hostages. All that money that was being gathered, shadily, by the United States, could then be funneled directly to the Contras to help them continue their fight against the Sandinistas. Between August and November of 1985, more than 600 anti-tank missiles were sold to Iran through the steel. One of the hostages was released in Lebanon. In December of 1985, though, this plan apparently changed. Now, these senior advisors wanted to sell the weapons directly to moderate Iranian army officials, and the funds collected from Iran would come directly to the United States and would be used to help fund the Contras in Nicaragua. Remember, these are the guys fighting the Sandinistas who are communist. Eventually, the Contras are going to get $30 million from this deal. This change in policy was proposed by Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. The administration did increase the cost of the weapons so that they'd make more of a profit. And initially, Iran balked. They didn't want to pay the extra money. But by February of 1986, they were paying. And so they were again receiving arms from the United States. Now, Hezbollah did release another hostage in July and eventually would release a third as well that year. But another group, believed to be an alias of Hezbollah, kidnapped three other Americans that year too. However, this plan, arms for hostages, continued through October of 1986. Then, at the beginning of November, a senior official in the Iranian army revealed this plan to a Lebanese newspaper, which first broke the story of this arms for hostages deal. Later that month, Oliver North began destroying documentation relating to this deal. The plan and its cover-up were revealed in endless congressional testimony held throughout 1987 and 1988. Somewhat ironically, Congress had begun funding the Contras again in October of 1986, just before the leak was done. However, the lag in funding for the Contras, basically between 1984 and 1986, forced them to look elsewhere for more continuous funding, and they found it by participating in the drug trade, which was originating in Panama, where dictator Manuel Noriega was not so secretly heading a drug cartel. And Noriega would eventually be removed from power, by the United States, and he would be brought to the U.S. and tried for a variety of drug-related crimes in 1992. He'd end up serving seven years in a U.S. prison before being extradited to France, where he would serve another sentence for human rights abuses against French citizens. Then he was returned to Panama in 2011 to serve the remainder of his term in prison there. Well, since the 1990s, some American analysts believe that the U.S.'s involvement with the Contras helped to create the rampant drug problem, particularly in cocaine, that is in evidence in the United States today. As for the original American hostages in Lebanon, well, they were eventually released by Hezbollah in 1991. So, in the Iran-Contra affair, we have the confluence of three important late 20th century themes, the Cold War, and the West's continuing concern about the spread of communism, decolonization, as Iran had a history of economic exploitation by the West, and globalization, which, as you'll soon learn, includes anti-Western sentiment in many parts of the world. A one lasting lesson of this particular event has been in its ever reverberating outcomes. The Western desire to influence the politics of other nations has sometimes meant providing support for people or for movements that would otherwise have been criticized. The Contras, for example, had a long human rights abuses record and yet were supported by the United States. That meddling has sometimes come back to haunt the West in sometimes horrific ways.